Well, hello and welcome back once again to Me, Myself, and I, Supplemental Number 5. This is uh, talking about the Book of Random Tables. This was a series of supplements that I used very early in the show, because I think it was one of the first ones that I picked up for the show. I, I remember, I, I didn't have this before I started the show, but I found it online. Somebody was talking about it somewhere, and uh, I picked it up and I bought the hard copies of uh, these. This is the book of Random Tables 1, and then there's 2, and there's 3, and look, there's 4! There may even be more of these, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, I I have uh, the PDFs from DriveThruRPG as well, which reminds me, if you want to support the show, you can check out the links to all of the products that I talk about in this video, and if you buy the product through the link in the notes below, then that's a little, a little way to support uh, this show at, at, at no additional cost to you, so... Uh, appreciate that, those of you who have done that. That's really great. It allows me to continue doing more of these shows and doing sort of wonderful things for you. And I have many wonderful things for you on the way. Very excited about uh, beginning the uh, Iron Sworn uh, adventure with Arn Kalapunki returning home to the Iron Lands. Very, very exciting. But that is not what we're talking about today. Today we are talking about the Book of Random Tables. So uh, this is by Matt Davids. Uh, and this is done by DiceGeeks.com. This is uh, an, a really, really fun and incredible resource because it is just a whole bunch of random bleh, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. If you can look at the table of contents here, you'll see names, male names. There's three tables of those and three tables of female names. The names that I used at the beginning of Me, Myself, and I was... They were mostly from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which is a D&D 5e supplement. One which I won't be reviewing here because it's a D&D supplement and eh, everyone knows about D&D. Uh, not everybody knows about this stuff. So then you've got all of this. Items and things. I love it. It's just <laughs> random stuff. Uh, the thing about these supplements is because they are sort of randomly like, like an explosion of different things. You kind of have to look at the table of contents to go, okay, is this book immediately useful for my session today? Uh, if the players are going to a wizard's tower, you might go, okay, what have we got here? Oh, look at this. Items in a wizard's chamber. Look at that. Or items in an alchemist's lab. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these because there's so many. But as you can see, just by looking at this table of contents, <laughs> there's a real range of, of stuff typically for fantasy kind of games. A warehouse, a royal tomb, uh, items on a dead goblin. Uh, items in an inn's kitchen, weapons, armor, equipment, and then encounters and events, forest encounters, mountain encounters, swamp, seafaring, catastrophes, rumors, and odd jobs. So, again, just so many random awesome things. Let's just randomly go to a table. Items in a portmaster's office. So let's say you rolled 76. 76 on items in a portmaster's office. So the characters are uh, in a port city, and maybe they're uh, they're trying to, to break into the portmaster's office to find some documents that might serve to, I don't know, frame him, who knows? Well, whatever the adventure is, and they, they go, okay, well, you know, they, they find the portmaster's uh, desk, and they manage to pick the lock and avoid any traps that are there, or whatever the case is, and they open it up, and what's in there? Well, uh, you roll 76, and look at this. Uh, there is a pirate flag. Interesting. What's a pirate flag doing in a portmaster's office? Is it something that he captured? Is it a trophy of his? Or is it perhaps the flag of his old ship that he is, in fact, secretly a pirate that is working with the pirates that are currently uh, raiding the shipping lanes just uh, off the island right now? I don't know. The point is, is that it just boop, gives you an idea. Or if you rolled 37. 37 here. Tax records. Well, that actually makes sense. There would be tax records there. Maybe that's a mundane find. Or maybe there's something in those tax records that's of immediate importance to the characters in their current mission. Because again, as with every single one of these supplements, context is king. Context is everything. So uh, that's that one. Um, if we just go to the second book now, the book of random tables. Du, that French for two. <laughs> Same basic idea. And we go to our contents page here. This is uh, a little more organized this time. Here we have goblin names and orc names and kobold names. So if for whatever reason you need to name some of the orcs that, that the characters are fighting or whatever, maybe they're, they're leading a peace mission to the goblin tribes to get them to put down their weapons. What's the name of the, uh, what's the name of the goblin king? Well, you roll d100 and you come up with 22 for the goblin name is, uh, Slag. That's a great name for a goblin. Yes, I'm Slag the Goblin King. So you've got your names, then you've got just dungeon rooms. What's in the dungeon room? This is an extremely useful item if your players are doing a lot of dungeon delving. And then you have items and things, which we saw in the first book. Items in a smithy, in a troll's cave, musical instruments, 
maps, adventuring gear, booths at a market. So it's kind of all over the place. And then people, these are general ideas on the kind of people you might meet, whether they're non-player characters or whether someone tells the, the PCs their fortune. They, they run across a, an old fortune teller or something in a, in, a, in a wagon off the side of the road and they tell the fortune. Um, I think that's what that is, 24 fortunes. Yes, yeah, so, and you roll a nine, let's say. Adversity is the parent of virtue. That's, that's a fortune a bit like Sean Connery's advice in um, Untouchables. If you're cold, stamp your feet. It's like, yeah, duh. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so that's a cool thing. So yeah, items and things, uh, people, non-combat encounters, always very useful. Reasons a player character is absent for a session, I love that. You know, as if you are running a game with a lot of players, uh, you know, and typically anything over four, you're gonna have scheduling issues after you get past a certain age, believe me. <laughs> believe me, when I was young, we used to play for 48 hours in a row every damn day. That's right, 48 hours in a row every day. Um, but, uh, you know, there's going to be people that can't show up for whatever reason. Um, so this, uh, this gives an in-game reason why that, uh, character is not there. Just, just cool stuff. Like, again, none of this is necessary, but it just adds a, a lot of great flavor and a lot of, uh, fun stuff. And then you got town names, and I think Hundatora came from this as well as Kitan. I think the city of Kitan came from this as well. Um, five tables here, uh, uh, for, for town names, all different kinds of names. So book three now is more of the same. And by more of the same, I of course mean an incredible diversity of material from all over the place. Uh, here we have more names. This time it's in names or names of knightly orders. I think the Order of the Purifying Flame may have come from this table. I don't actually remember. Uh, I might've just made up that incredibly original and unique name <laughs> on the fly. Uh, encounters and locations, desert encounters, forest locations, road encounters, woodland animals. Again, this is stuff just to pepper your environment, right? To really uh, randomly give a sense that there is a living, breathing world out there. Now that is a phrase that I use all the time in these episodes because again, I'm a very uh, atmosphere centric uh, GM, I believe in trying to immerse my players into the world as much as possible. So these little tiny details really make the players feel like there's there's a lot more going on in the world than just them and their little them and their little quest, whatever that may be. Uh, again, items and things. This time's items in a cell or in a chest or on a dead orc or jewelry or in adventurous saddlebags or items in a wagon or in a wine cellar. Uh, food and drink. This is a great one, you know where the players, they go into an inn and they say, okay, well, you know what? Let's let's celebrate our success at the Lost Temple of blah, blah. And uh, we're going to spend a bunch of money. Well, what's on the menu here? And you, the GM, go, uh, bread and venison, because it's a fantasy game. And of course, bread and venison is ubiquitous. But let's say you wanted to actually have something a little more imaginative than bread and venison. Then pow, you go to this table here and look at this seafood. Oh, well, the characters say, uh, yes, well, 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 well give, give us uh, your main course tonight, my good man. And uh, and so you as the GM say, ah, oh, yes, well, the, uh, the, the, the uh, innkeeper is very, very, uh, very proud of himself because tonight his chef has outdone himself and in fact has, and you roll a 96. And on the menu is, ooh, pike. Pike, roast pike, garnished with lemons, or whatever. Uh, or you rolled 32, albacore tuna. Oh God, it's like sushi. Oh my God, this is a sushi place. hindutor has got the best sushi for miles around. Anyway, there's all kinds of cool stuff here. Herring, with a herring. Tilefish, scallops, sea cucumber, rainbow trout. You get the idea. It gives you a little bit of more detail that, that helps you flesh out that world and make it seem like it is alive, vibrant, and breathing. This is the fourth one in the series. I think by now you're getting the idea of, you know, how these books are organized and structured. So here we are in book four, and this particular book gives us, dun dun dun, gives us more names, elf, halfling, dwarf, and dwarf clan names. Again, uh, my particular world was not populated with a lot of demi-humans. In fact, I don't think they ever encountered any demi-humans, um, as we used to call them in the old days of D&D. Uh, so, uh, but if your world is a sort of standard box, standard D&D game, you're going to have that. So that's a really useful, uh, thing to have. Encounters, again, underground, jungle, in encounters, sea-related encounters, really useful stuff. Let's have a quick look at that, because I want to give you an example. So let's say they're in that inn, they've just had their rainbow trout or whatever, and, uh, you want something interesting to, ha to happen to the party in the middle of dinner. So you roll a 33. 33 on the in encounters means the party is told the man in the corner bought them all drinks. 
Ha! Huh. So in the middle of their dinner, they're they're loud and boisterous. They're obviously celebrating their great treasure hall from the temple. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the 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 waitress comes along and says, "Oh well, uh, my friends." Uh, Put that a tray of drinks. This was uh, bought round for the house, uh, uh, bought uh, by yonder fellow in the corner. And they look and they see, who is it? Well, let's go to our UNE supplement, our universal NPC emulator, and find out who that is. Right or not, whatever you want to do. Uh, just little things like that to spark uh, imagination, to spark potential adventure hooks as well. The great thing about... Um, uh, running a live game with you know other actual players is that they if they are uh, if they are proactive players they could see something like that and they could grab onto that and go you know what this is interesting I want to follow this thread now if you're just making this up you don't actually have a thread to follow which is why the mythic GM emulator comes into it because you don't have to have something ready because that thing will help you create it on the fly anyway you've already seen uh, episode one of this little series that talks about the emulator so again these things are just a hodge but it's like a, it's like a scatter gun of ideas uh, people and characters critical fails for melee attacks the cause of death of some character right goals mutations curses critical fails critical success. again none of it absolutely necessary but all of it really 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 useful so that is the book of random tables love it love it love it if you guys want to get your hands on these PDFs, um, you can get them from Drive Through RPG at the links below. And once again, if you click on those links uh, and you you purchase the product through those links, it'll help uh, the show a little bit. So that is the book of random tables. There is one more supplement I want to talk about very quickly, or at least touch on. It's not a supplement that I used in the game, but it is a supplement that I was turned on to by one of you loyal viewers out there. And I have found this thing now, and I think it is just the coolest thing ever. This thing is the Tome of Adventure Design. Uh, I hadn't heard of this before, but apparently it's been out there for a while. This is a comprehensive adventure creation source book for Swords and Wizardry and the Pathfinder, role, Pathfinder role-playing game. I don't play either of those games, but as you have learned about me, if you've watched my show, I don't particularly care what the system is, as long as the supplement is great in terms of its uh, ability to generate random ideas. And brother, does this thing generate the random ideas? It is just fantastic. The whole first, uh, uh, it's divided up into four books, basically. The first book is all about adventure design, villains, locations, what the villain's plan is, who the villain is, why they want to do what they're doing. Really, really inspiring stuff. Book two is monsters, all kinds of stuff about how to design unique monsters uh, to, to, you know, like what kind of attacks they have, what, what, what their uh, ecology is, all that kind of stuff. Book three, dungeon design. This is just fan. This, I mean, this, this book alone is just chock full of stuff uh book four non-dungeon adventure design so wilderness stuff again this stuff is uh, this this is like a scatter gun of ideas too um uh thanks so much to um boy i can't remember the viewer who uh who turned me on to this unfortunately but you know who you are so shout out to you buddy <laughs> for for bringing this to my attention so that is it, and that basically brings us to the end of not only this episode, but the end of our little supplementary series, because that's pretty much an overview of all the different supplements that I used in the show. So I've got a few ideas of things that I'm going to do for you next. Um, I may, in fact, have another little thing I do before we jump into season two. The only reason why I say that is because uh, I'm working on a few little things for season two that are, are still being uh, created, like uh, I, I'm trying to do original music and stuff like that, so I'm having that produced, and I'm trying to create new miniature terrain and stuff just for visual effect, so hopefully I can get all that done, um, and once I do, uh, we'll be able to launch into the Iron Sworn game, but in the meantime, I might do a special little episode or two, uh, a little episode sort of further showing how I use the Mythic GM emulator. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Uh, very busy time, obviously, and it's a, it's a crazy time in the world, as we all know right now. Uh, so uh, I don't have as much time as I would like to. So that's that. Thanks once again for watching. And um, again, uh, like and subscribe and <laughs> smash that like button. Whoa! <laughs> I'm the worst YouTuber ever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, uh, tell your friends. Talk about the show if you can. All the usual spiel. Um, really appreciate it, guys, and we will see you next time uh, on Me, Myself, and Die. Ciao for now.